And this is it. You made it. Week five, Take Back Your Life, starts now. Uh, if you have a Bible, 2 Samuel chapter 6 is where we're going to be for a message that I'm calling The King Passing By. The King Passing By. I'm going to read to you this whole chapter. I could have cut it down and picked a couple things to not read. But honestly, it's all so good. And I'm going to be reading it for a minute. And as we go through it, you're going to be like, this is a lot. What am, I, what am I supposed to do with all that? Just hang on for the ride. But if you're thinking, Levi, you're reading a lot of scripture. I'm just going to tell you something. Well, you need a lot of work, all right? So <laughs> just go with me on this journey. And don't forget, you probably watched like 17 episodes of whatever on whatever platform this week, too. So this, this 23 verses is going to be better for you than whatever that was. It says in 2 Samuel 6, again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. So they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, it's not Ohio, it's a, different, it's a different name, Ahio, the son of Abinadab, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on a hill, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments of fur, wood on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on sistrums, and on cymbals. And when they came to nachons or nachos, I don't know how you pronounce that, threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error. And he died there by the ark of God. David became angry, notice, because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. And he called the name of this place Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David. But David took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months when the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Now it was told King David saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. And so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Then he distributed among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both the women and multitude of Israel and the men to everyone. Here's what they got. A loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. So all the people departed, everyone to his house. Then David returned to bless his household. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how glorious was the king of Israel today uncovering himself in the eyes of the maids of the servants as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. So David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord 
and I will be even more undignified than this. And I will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Mosquitoes have nothing to do with malaria. That was common knowledge at the end of the 1800s going into the beginning of the 1900s. The experts believed that the ants were the culprit behind mosquito infections that broke out. And the experts of the day uh, did everything that they could in areas where malaria and yellow fever were breaking out to keep ants off of people, especially sick people. And this logical fallacy, this, this, this misthinking, this misunderstanding of, of reality was responsible for the deaths of over 20,000 people during one of the most ambitious building projects in all of human history. And I'm talking, of course, about the 50-mile stretch called the Panama Canal that links the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean so that boats can save the 8,000 plus mile trip around South America and just take that little shortcut through Central America. Uh, but building it, of course, was easier said than done. It was 30 years in the, in the building. In today's currency, it cost about $7 billion. And during the first two decades that the project was being undertaken, there were just about 20,000, 22, 23,000 people died almost all of them of yellow fever and malaria, and none of them uh, got those diseases from ants. And yet, the experts uh, believed and, and, and preached that the ants bring the, the, the diseases up from the earth, and so we just got to stop the ants, just got to stop the ants. And, and uh, in the first couple decades of the, them trying to build the Panama Canal, it was the French who were doing it, but then they eventually ran out of money, and the project was scrapped for a while. And then thanks to Teddy Roosevelt and the United States' ambition and desire to have a sea passageway primarily for our military to be able to, to get to and fro on the Earth, uh, we took uh, this project on. But the experts, again, uh, incorrectly believed that, no, we need to really do just war on these ants. And, uh, and, and so they wouldn't allow purchases of screens uh, for hospital windows, which would have kept mosquitoes out. And the, one, of the, one of the worst things that, that I came across in my reading about the Panama Canal, because I was mildly obsessed with it for a summer uh, a couple of years ago, uh, was the fact that the, to keep the ants away, they would take uh, any tree and that was out in the garlic like fruit trees, and they would put what's called a crockery ring around the tree. And the crockery ring was basically a little man-made moat to keep ants off the trees. And they, they so believed that the ants were going to try and bring these diseases to people that in every hospital, which you have to understand, at the height of the death rate, three out of four people who were admitted to the hospitals uh, at the work site of the Panama Canal died. Three out of four. And that's because every bed would be set, all the four legs of the bed would be set into little bowls of water so that no ants could climb up the bed. And, then, and the ants were like, all right, sorry, we weren't going to come anyway. And, and, uh, and, and yet the windows were fully open. And you know what loves stagnant water? You know what loves man-made pools of, of fresh water? The specific kind of mosquito that carries yellow fever. And so this disease ran rampant as they were trying to keep the ants away, but it was the mosquitoes that were the real problem. And to see what a difference it made, uh, after the Americans began working at it, and it was finally two and two were put together on the mosquitoes, they installed cur uh, screens on every single window and got rid of all the little moats, the crockery rings of water. And in the final 10 years, up until 1915, when the Panama Canal was finally opened, only 3,000 additional people died when 22,000 had died in the previous two decades going into it. So the point is, you can do the right thing the wrong way. They were fighting the disease. They were doing everything they could to get rid of the disease. They just happened to be fighting the wrong enemy. They were trying to get rid of ants when it was the mosquitoes that were the problem. And that is exactly what's happening here in this passage. 
we see Uzzah doing the right thing the wrong way. Now let's back up because it just seems so aggressive to us reading it, but also to David who was just so shocked by it. Because we know David had this heart's desire to bring God to the center of his life and to bring God to the center of the nation of Israel. And so no sooner had he taken over the city, Jerusalem, which was at one point controlled by the Jebusites, than he realized and, de and desired greatly to bring the Ark of the Covenant from where it had been sitting stagnant and static for three decades since it had been restored from the Philistines who took control over it because they sort of thought it was like a, you know, like a, a, a piece of, sac uh, you know, sacred memorabilia. They thought it was like a really divine, you know, rabbit's foot keychain. And they took it from the nation of Israel, thinking that it would, you know, bring them good luck. And it brought no nothing but bad luck to the Philistines. It was like some Indiana Jones action uh, for sure. And so they, they let it go, let the Israelites have it back. But they just kind of left it parked at this guy's house. And Uzzah was this guy's son, Abinadab's son. And for three decades, it sat there. And David details for us the process of, of, of his longing to see the ark, which symbolized the presence of God, which symbolized the glory of God that is able to cover over our sins. And that's, it's this like little snapshot of heaven. It's this little the glimpse into God's presence. That's why there was angels covering over it. And inside of it was the broken 10 commandments, the, 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 the 10 commandments that were made after Moses broke the original ones. Uh, he had sort of like this anger problem. Anyhow, different story. But, but, but it, was, it was a symbol of what needs to happen in order for our inability to keep God's law to be covered over. What has to happen for us to once again enter into the presence of God that we had access to before the fall? And so this box, this, this, this gold-covered box was symbolic of the presence of God. And so in David's uh, notes that he wrote in Psalm 132, he talks about how he couldn't sleep and he, he, he couldn't eat because he just longed to see God's presence in the heart of the nation of Israel. He, he longed to see the whole nation of Israel take their lives back from the idolatry and the foolishness and the smallness. He wanted the ark restored. He wanted there to be joy and gladness that would come from the presence of God for them all to tap into a, a different way to be human than just doing what their neighbors did, to doing what, what the world did. He, he, he longed to see this happen. And that was a good desire. And he delegated to this family that had been for three decades taking care of the, the ark. And so Abinadab's son, Uzzah, had this tremendous idea. Let's bring the ark back in style. Let's bring the ark back, not how it always used to be carried, but let's do it like the Philistines did. And so again, the right thing is being done in the wrong way because Exodus 25 specifically prohibited any method of transportation for the Ark of the Covenant that's not two poles carried by four dudes. And not just any dudes. These are descendants of, of Moses, these, this, this tribe of the, the Levites. They were supposed to carry the Ark and on their shoulders carrying it uh, as the poles were put through these four rings and they were never to be taken out. And that was the only way it was to be uh, transported and it was never supposed to be touched by human hands. But Uzzah, Uzzah knew better and, you know, we need to update things and, you know, uh, what, is, what does God really even care? And, and so he put the ark on a cart, which was how the Philistines transported it. And then much worse, when it began to tip over as the oxen stumbled, he reached out his hand and as he did, God struck him on the spot and he died. And it seems so harsh. It seems like, whoa, that is, that is aggressive. God has, God has anger issues. This seems so unwarranted. Just one little infraction. And the guy doesn't even get a warning. It's just like, bang. But the reality is, this is the tip of a much bigger iceberg in Uzzah's life that we're seeing here. For he had spent the last 30 years guarding this box and understanding the regulations and all of these things. He had access to all of this information. He knew the rules. He understood all of these things. The problem was he had obviously begun to feel self-important, which is easy to do when you've been given an important job. 
And that's the easiest thing in the world. God has given us an important job of carrying the message of Jesus into the world. But we must never confuse the important job we've been given with a great inflated sense of self-importance ourselves, that we don't need to do the things that God has called us to do, and that the ends justify the means, and that we're able to do sort of what we want. Uzzah represents for us this sort of religious spirit. And, and Eugene Peterson puts it very well in his, auto, his biography on the life of David when he says, Uzzah is the person who has God in a box and officiously assumes responsibility for keeping God safe from the mud and dust of the world. Men and women keep showing up who take it upon themselves to protect God from the vulgarity of sinners and the ignorance of common people. His death wasn't sudden. It was years in the making. You see, Uzzah had adopted a sort of religious formality and his reaction to put his hand out to, to take care of God. Oh, I, I got this, God. His, his sort of, I don't need to obey how you've told me to approach you. I don't need to, to do the things you've called me to do. It's enough that I've, I've brought you along for the journey. You should be very happy for that. Oh, God, look what a nice little cart I got you to, to ride on. You may fit into this hour of my Sunday. What about the rest of the week? Ah, oh, I get to do whatever I want. But, but, but God, how nice of me to allow you to be here for this moment for this hour. You see, he heard the same music that everybody else heard, but there was no dancing inside of Uzzah's soul. And that's because he was outwardly formal, going through the motions, but there was no reality on the inside. But here's the truth, and you need to let this sink in. This is the, the beating heart of this message. A religion you can control has no power to save your soul. There was no reality. There was no life. There was no pulse. Uzzah was in control. God was riding on Uzzah's little toy cart. He reached his hand out to catch God because God was going to That is just so telling. Let me tell you something. You don't need a God who you have to catch. You want a God who can catch you. You want a God who can hold you. You, you, you do not want a God who you have to keep from falling over. And so. Uzzah's death, which had been for years slowly unfolding and, in, and evolving, finally became permanent. David's horrified. David's caught like in the middle. He's like, there's this thing happening here. He's like, he, he just had, you have to picture David had these, the best intentions. Like he's just trying to be king. He's just a shepherd kid who loves God with his heart. And he's like, oh man, I can't handle that the ark's out there. It needs to be here. So the moment he took this capital city and it'd be called the, the city of David, he's like, man, God needs to be at the center of it. He's getting prime real estate. We're going to have a Party. So we get, he, he's a musician, so he brings all his musician friends, and, and there's all this music. And then he sees Uzzah's got the cart, and he's like, I don't know. What, that does, I, that does, I'm not sure that's how it's, but he probably knows. And then now all of a sudden, Uzzah's dead, and he's like, party's canceled. I am out of here. This just got real. And the text says he was angry at God. And the text says that he was, he was unwilling to, to go any further, which shows you that, that God is, is not a capricious God that God wasn't just waiting for someone to blow it so he could smite them with his judgment. It shows you that Uzzah clearly had been on a journey where he had been given opportunity after opportunity to open himself up to a reality that was more than just the outward professionalism of his job that he needed to do because he was such an important guy. And he gets to walk with his arms swinging and the cart dragging behind him. And I'll, I'll, I got you, God. I, don't worry, I got you. I'm, you're lucky that I'm, that I'm here to keep you from, from skinning your, your knee. No, if, if God was angry and, 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 and just going to strike someone down at the first mention, then wouldn't he have dealt with David when he hear, is here angry at God? David's mad. David's confused. David doesn't understand. And God does nothing but pour out blessing. And that's because God can handle your emotion. He's a God big enough to hold you, even when you're frustrated, even when you're confused, even when you're hurting, even when you're crying. And so David leaves the ark at Obed-Edom's house, and God just starts pouring out blessing. He's so good, he blesses even when he's ignored. 
David hears about the blessings that are going down. He's like, I'm going to get me some of that. And so David says, all right, let's, let's do this again. But I, I've learned something. David has, has, has assessed the situation. He took some time to read himself some Exodus 25. And he's like, y'all better bring those poles. What? And, and so the guys get the ark carried properly. That, that, that cart got burned. And, and so now they're ready. All right, take two. Right, here we are. And so they, they begin to take a, a step. One. Two, three, four, five, six. They're about to take a step. David says, halt, stops them right there, dead in their tracks. Hold that ark perfectly still. And he has a sacrifice brought in. And the sacrifice is, is butchered and then offered to God. And we're not just told that it was a sacrifice. We're told the exact form of sacrifice. There was a whole bunch of different sacrifices in the Old Testament. But one of them, the one that David did here, was called a burnt offering. Now, the difference about a burnt offering is before this was offered up, hands would be placed upon the head of this beast. And ceremonially, all of the sins of those who were offering this up would be transferred upon it. It was basically like in school when your teacher can't show up. What do they bring in? A substitute teacher. That was what this was. This animal became a substitute. It was saying, there's a price to be paid for what I've done. And instead of me bearing it out, thank you, God, that it's transferred to the head of this animal. It's essentially a picture of the cross. The whole system of burnt offerings. We're looking forward to the day when Jesus would hang on the tree. And as he hung there, Isaiah says, the sins of us all were laid upon him. God looked at him who never sinned as though he had committed all sin so that he might look at us who have committed sin and see the righteousness of God. Come on. Thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to be our substitute, right? To, to get a little like Hunger Games. He, he volunteered his tribute and became like Katniss Everdeen. His name was not pulled in the reaping, but he was willing to be sent in, right? He was willing to be hung up. The, talk about the ballad of snakes, right? A hung up on a pole, the Bible says. As Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so Jesus was lifted up on the cross. He was our sin bearer. And that's what David was saying. You see, David realized the problem was Uzzah had this, this religious formality. Uzzah had this deadness on the inside. He was putting God on his little toy cart. David said, no, I realize the only way I can stand before God, the only way that we can have the presence of God is if someone deals with our sin nature, if someone deals with our heart. So what he was doing was pointing forward to the cross. And it was significant that he had this take place at the sixth step, the sixth step. You see, seven in the Bible represents a completion or a fullness, a totality of a revolution, right? Like seven days in the week, then a new week begins. David was saying at the sixth step, being the place where the sacrifice is offered, he was saying there can be no completion without forgiveness. There cannot be anything accomplished without God's power. There cannot be anything done except for the blood of Jesus that's running down the mercy seat under where the angels gaze. That's the only way that any of us can have a right relationship with God. It's not about us just being good enough and carrying God in our cart to enough services and, and, and going to enough things and, and checking boxes so that God will eventually go, wow, look at how great they're doing. It's all about someone who has done nothing wrong, but who was willing to pay for our sins so that we can be whole. And only then can there be that seventh step. Only then can there be that being right with God. Only then can there be the wholeness and the peace on the inside that every single one of us crave, that every single one of us desire, and that we all need. And when that sixth step and then the sacrifice and then the seventh step were finally taken. Then and only then did the music begin to play again. And David, he began to dance. But he, as he danced, he realized looking down, there was a problem. He was wearing royal garments. And this wouldn't do because he realized as he saw what was happening as the blood ran red on that way into Jerusalem, he saw that there was a king passing by. And he realized that he was not that king. You see, he was a king, little K, 
but the king, the king of kings was passing by. The king of kings that, that was the Passover lamb that was spread upon the, uh, upon the doorposts of the households in Egypt that pointed forward to Jesus. The blood that ran down their mercy, it pointed forward to Jesus. He was, he was realizing in the moment a king was passing by. And when you realize your sins have been paid for, when you realize you've been forgiven, not because of anything you can do, but because someone else, a third party who was innocent, substituted himself for you. All that is left to do is to dance. All that's left to do is let the joy carry you away. All that's let, left to do is let the music swirl in your soul and free and happy and, and no longer preoccupied with what do people think about me and am I doing right? David just began to dance. And like we learned last week, doing all to the glory of God, David didn't just dance. He danced with all his might. He was leaping and whirling and joyful because he realized the king was passing by. And he was a part of the parade. He was a part of the story. He was a part of helping bring the ark into the center of the city and the center of the nation so more people could experience it, so more people could know what joy is to be found in a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So what about Michael? Because you read this, you're like, OK, Uzzah, don't know about that, but but OK, I hear what you're saying. David, all right, David's a passionate guy. But what about my, what are we to do with this, with this little like footnote at the end of like, hey, and as David was dancing and as he was going by, his wife, Michael, was watching from a window and uh, was not pleased. In fact, the text says she despised David when she saw that he was dancing around only wearing a linen ephod. Now, let me help you out. He's not like in his whitey tidies, all right? So like the picture, like, oh my gosh, David's dancing in a linen ephod. She had every right to be upset with him. No, 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 no. That's not the deal. His royal garments would have been this outer outfit of pomp, this outer outfit that displayed this ornate symbol of power and strength and, and majesty. And underneath it would have been this simple tunic. This, so let me translate it into our culture. David took off a tuxedo and threw on jeans and a t-shirt. He was wearing the simple attire of a servant, uh, the day laborer. Uh, he's not wearing the coat of many colors, all right? <laughs> Joseph, he's, he's just wearing a, a simple outfit. He's got his car hearts on. He's just, he's just one of the people now. He realizes that we all have in common that we have a king here. And I might have the title of, of sovereign over the nation, but I do so under the authority of the king here. I serve at his pleasure. And so David is, 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 is adorning himself with the attire of a servant because he realizes before God, that's all any of us are, whatever we've been called to do. And even the meal he sent them all out with at the end of the day, he sent every single person, regardless of their station or class, with, with this amazing gift, this meal in a bag. And it included a cake of raisins. Now, all of it, you're like, it's like what is this? It's like a, on an airplane, they're handing out the snack box. Oh, a little, little box of raisins and, and a little meat stick. And oh, it's, it's, it's the tapas one with hummus. And you're very exciting, right? It's not a lot of hummus. I will save that tiny scoop for later in the flight, right? But, but, but you have to understand, all the things he gave out were delicacies. Everything he gave out to them that day, everybody gets one of these. He was, he was basically saying, I, as the king, am dressing now like a servant because I realize I'm just one of these people who are all sons and daughters. But he's also realizing, just as it also causes us to want to humble ourselves to know the power of Jesus, it also elevates us all. And he saw that every single person, regardless of the job that they had, the money in the bank, or, or what their station in life was, if they would embrace a relationship with God through Jesus, they would all be elevated to be sons and daughters of the King of Kings. So he was saying, y'all get to feed like, eat like royalty today, because in Jesus' name, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. And that's the power. We, when we embrace the servant's towel, when we embrace the lowly position, we are elevated as sons and daughters of the King of Kings. To, to be used in great and spectacular ways. Y'all, we got we to we eat raisins. That didn't excite you nearly as much <laughs> as it was meant to. And every single thing I just mentioned to you, Michael hated. Michael despised this. And that's why when David came home, he had been blessing around the world, uh, blessing the, the whole nation. He came home, and it was a, a dark cloud and a dark shadow inside his own home. 
And I just want to just stop there and speak that, that, that God doesn't just look at what we do outside. He looks at what happens in the house. He, he doesn't just see, talk about the right thing the wrong way. I'm going to do great things for God, but you're mean at home. I want to do great things to God, but you're swatting all the ants and you're missing the mosquitoes. Because if it ain't working at home, honey, it ain't working. And, and God doesn't just look at what you do in business and what you do in philanthropy and what you do in, in ministry. He looks at how you treat your kids, how you treat your brother, how you treat your wife, how you treat your your mama. And so as he comes home, there's, there's this issue. And she's like, oh, wow, well, how undignified you were in the sight of all these, these servants wearing your, your linen ephod. What was she saying? Well, if you want to understand the meaning, you have to see the title given to her. Three times in the passage, she is referred to not as David's wife, but as the daughter of Saul. And it's for a reason every single time. Because it shows us that that's the lens and the worldview that she's processing this through. She's not seeing this through. She's not seeing herself as the wife of David. She's seeing herself and her identity. We talked about that last week, how important identity. She's the daughter of Saul. And Saul would never have done what David was doing. Saul cared so much about appearances. Saul, Saul cared so much about the outward. Saul cared so much about being important and being elevated. He didn't start out that way, but he quickly got that way. And she did not like this because she was basically Uzzah 2.0. And that's the interesting thing about the Old Testament. It's oftentimes not linear. And as we read 2 Samuel 6, what we're getting is this circular, the same thing, the same theme being revisited from several different angles. So we saw what it looked like and what the, what the deadness led to eventually long term in Uzzah. And now we're seeing the same thing in miniature popping up in the heart of Michael. She didn't mind God being there, but she certainly didn't want it to be all bloody. She didn't, she didn't mind him you know, showing up. Like, yeah, God can come. But she would have been much more content for, for God to be on the cart. And for David to be just walking, all right, don't, don't get too crazy about all this. She didn't like this leaping and what, caught up in it. She's like, I don't mind a little bit of God on Christmas and Easter, but, but we don't need to get carried away with it. But let me tell you something. A, a, a religion that you can control has no power to save your soul. Right? God didn't just come to affect your schedule. He came to radically turn your life upside down, or more to the point, right side up, to invade every part, every pore, every, every square inch of your life and soul and being to where you, like David, are carried away by the music of the one who loves your soul, to where you leap and dance and, and, and sing to him with all your heart. So Michael, too, wanted to keep God on a cart. And where do we see the death there? Because Uzzah's death was immediate. We have to go forward to see the end of Michael, the death of Michael. For it says, she had no children from that day forward to the rest of her life. You see, you can't multiply if you won't dance. There can't be that spreading. There can't be that, that multiplication. So there was a death to her in the story where she could have been involved in the lineage. God instead chose Bathsheba. And so David and Bathsheba, her, their story involved sin. Their story involved pain. Their story involved regret. But those things became the fertile ground where there could be humility, where there could be repentance, where there could be gratitude for a God so good he washes our sins where they're like crimson. He washes them white as snow. So God in your life is not looking for the regal perfection of a Michael or an Uzzah who looks great on the outside, but on the inside, there's death. On the inside, there's nothing but emptiness and pride and contempt. God's looking for that broken spirit that's willing to obey him, even if it's imperfectly, and trust him for the salvation only he can bring. Now, as we begin to wind this down, just a couple takeaway truths that I would love to just impart to you that I see from this as, as we continue to go forth in this journey. Uh, to take back our lives, which is an ongoing assignment. And uh, the first is, don't let failure stop you. David started in 2 Samuel 6 with some great intentions. Yeah, I want to I bring the ark back. Like, that's awesome. That's amazing. No sooner had he done it than someone's dying, and God's mad. He's like, now no, I'm mad. Everything's going bad. And I love that. It took, hey, you know, it took him time. But three months later, he's like, you know, I'm going to give it another shot. I'm going to give it another try. And I, I, we're not going to always get it right. We're not always going to get it right in marriage. We're not always going to get it right in our relationship with God or sharing our faith or 
you know, in business or anything, there's going to be mistakes that are going to get made. It's going to get messy at times. Uh, but you just got to keep trying. I see such power in David showing up again and giving it another shot, this time armed with the blood of Jesus, this time armed with great power. One of the favorite stories I tell out of the many, many, many stories in this book is the, the story of the creation of WD-40. Every one of us has some of this in our house somewhere. And most of us have you know, two or three things probably today that we need to go spray some of this on. And uh, anyhow, I love that the story of WD-40 being named as it is comes from the fact that it was the 40th attempt that chemist Norm Larson attempted as he was trying to come up with the perfect anti-corrosion spray, something that would displace water. And WD-40 literally means water displacement perfected on the 40th try. That is to say, 39 times he sucked. 39 times he missed it. 39 times he was in there with the beakers and the Bunsen burner and getting his breaking bat on. And ah, 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 ah. 39. I mean, how amazing is that, that he kept showing up, kept, I believe in, I can do it. Come on. I mean, just encourage you. It might take 40 tries. It might take 40 more. But keep showing up. Keep getting up. Just keep trying. Don't let failure stop you. If I could, I would give every one of you a little bottle of WD-40 just to keep out as a reminder that, that mistakes are going to be made in this messy relationship with God through Jesus. But thanks be to God that it's not about our perfection. It's about Jesus' perfection. So we just get to keep trying and keep getting up. Secondly, I want to tell you that you are never more vulnerable than in victory. Victory in David's heart. I want to do this thing. Enemy attacks through Uzzah's religiosity. David gets the ark into the city successfully. Everyone's got their raisins, goes home. Bam, sucker punch waiting for him at home. I like how Charles Spurgeon put it. He said, pirates always look out for loaded vessels. Pirates look out for ships that are heavy in the water, knowing it's been filled up. Now we're going to rob it. They don't show up to, to rob a, an empty ship. Pirates look out for loaded vessels. And the enemy will almost always come after you after a mountain high. Let me warn you, now that you've come through these 40 days and maybe seen some ground, I've been talking to so many people like, man, this has been great. I've been connecting with God. I've been growing. I've been seeing things come out of the think, breathe, and live time and prayers and verses. I feel like I'm just growing. That's when you want to be on your guard. The enemy will try and do something or, or mess with you there. I, I see such an opportunity for David to get discouraged going home and, and seeing you know, Michael throwing shade on him. But he chooses to say, no, I'm going to be even more undignified. Meaning he's saying, I'm going to ratchet up my passion. You're trying to keep me back from, from showing passion. I'm going to even ratchet it up even more. He was saying, I see the enemy's attack in this. So when he comes in and tries to snuff out your fire, pour even more fuel on it in that it don't take it as a sign that you're doing something wrong, but that, that as evidence that you're doing the right thing. And then lastly, let me say that what you see, this is takeaway truth, what you see is what you get. What you see is what you get. They all looked, Michael, Uzzah, David, all looked at the same box, box covering in gold, but they all, all saw different things. Michael saw a king humiliating himself. He should have kept his robes on, being willing to be humble and stoop to be one of the people. She saw the king, lower K, passing, lowercase k, passing by. David, reverently, humbly, saw the king passing by. What do you see in front of you? I like how Emerson put it. He said that today is a king in disguise. Let us not be so deceived. Let us unmask the king as he passes. What you see is what you get. When you look at your kids, when you look at your car, when you look at your job, when you look at your life, you can choose to just see normal, just see average, just see ordinary, see things you're not thankful for, things you would change if you could. Or you can choose in the midst of it to say, this is just a king in disguise. I see God's hand in this. I see he's got a plan. I see he's up to something. You can choose to say over the seeds of what you're facing, this is big. This is huge. If I could take you in a time machine back 13 years to the first Fresh Life church service that we ever had, you would have seen 14 people. You would have seen what would just be a 
seed compared to now. You never would have thought, I never would have thought God could do all that he's doing all around the world, millions of dollars going out, lives being saved, people spread out in homes all around the country and world deployed as these little Airbnbs meant to be all apart, linked up as a house, a house that he's building for people from all around the world to know their sins can, can be forgiven, that they can be helped and healed and whole. You never would have thought that any of this, I never would have thought any of this could come out of that first initial service. It was just a seat. It was a king in disguise. Let's live lives of faith. Let's live lives of belief. Let's walk around always excited, always aware. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. Today's a king, a king in disguise. Come on, speak to the king inside the heart of your child. Speak to the, the queen in the heart of your daughter. Believe that God is up to something. He has not forgotten about you. He has not abandoned you. He's just in disguise waiting for you to see something and say something for what you see is what you get. So let's every sixth step stop and trust God and believe. We will see things complete and see things full in Jesus' name. Yes. And Father, we thank you for what you've done in our hearts through the weeks of this journey. And I pray a special blessing on the heart of every person who even now is choosing to believe by faith that you're there. We want to see the king, even though you're often in disguise. If that's you I'm describing, and you would just say, I want to, I want to believe for that in the midst of the simplicity of my apartment or my dorm room or this job I, I hate. I want to see the king in the midst of my marriage and my medical difficulty I'm facing. I want to see you in the midst of it, God. I want to unmask the king as he passes. If that's you, I'm describing, just raise your hand up. You're saying, God, I want to see you. I want you to open my eyes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your blessing, like oil dripping down upon our brows, a symbol of your spirit, of you right there whispering, I love you. I have plans for you. I just want to encourage you that God has not sent the gospel into the world on carts. His gospel is always to be carried on the shoulders of people. You have been given the assignment of carrying the name of Jesus on your shoulder, carrying the name of Jesus into your sports team, into your, into your school, into your neighborhood. And God has given you the strength and grace to carry that well and to steward it well so that more people might know him. You can put your hands down. I believe you're blessed and strengthened by God to carry his name this week, sent out. And if you're watching this and you've never trusted Jesus as Savior, today's the day, right now, right where you are. There's an emptiness in all of our hearts that can't be filled with sex or money, drugs or fame, travel or status but only through a relationship with Jesus, the one whose blood ran down that cross to pay our bill. And if you trust him as your savior right now, he will forgive you and make you new. He will teach you an entirely new way to be human where you're healthy on the inside and ready to do whatever he's called you to do on the outside. To, to hear that music and dance is where it begins. If you sense him speaking to you right now and you say, Levi, I've, I've gone to church, I've been religious, I've put God on a cart tons of times but I want to be born again. I, want to be, I, want, I don't want to be dead anymore. I want to be alive. Alive on the inside. Alive on the outside. If that's you, I'm describing, just raise your hand up. God sees you right there. God sees you. Raise your hand up. Raise your hand up. Raise your hand up. Raise your hand up. Pray this prayer with me. Dear God, I'm broken. Make me new. I see you. Forgive me. Help me to dance with all my might. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, God bless you, every single one of you.